Um, no matter what you've been through, what you've done, or what's been done to you, you, you need to understand this, okay? This, this part's free. I'm not charging for this one. I'm taking a step aside from being paid to be Pastor Curtis, and I'm just going to be Pastor Curtis for a minute. Um, I'm not paid to say this. I honestly, truly care about each and every one of you. I really do. And you need to understand that all of that love comes from the one who can love you a million times better than I could, and that is Christ. We've been going through this season here in the church. If you can believe it, this is our seventh week of exploring the history of the church. We, we started in 3 AD, and we've been exploring what it is that Christians believe. What have we wrestled with? What, 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 what oppressions have we struggled with? Why is it that we worship the way we do? Who are we? And how has God moved and flowed throughout the history of the church? We, we've been through all of that. And believe it or not, after seven weeks, we're up to the 1800s. Actually, the late 1700s at this point. And last week, we started talking about the guy that God used to start the Methodist movement. Okay? His name is John Wesley. Um, Hopefully you've heard me say this before. I truly, honestly believe this. We as Methodists do not have the corner on the market of Jesus. You do not need to be Methodist to get into heaven. Okay? When we stand before the Almighty, I don't think he's going to go, Are you a good United Methodist or not? He's going to say, Did you love my son? Did you accept him in your heart as your Savior? And did you do the best you could with what you had? If we can say yes... I truly believe he's going to say, welcome home, good and faithful servant. Okay? But you need to understand that John Wesley, as we talked about last week, he struggled his whole life with trying to earn God's grace, with being good enough, with praying enough, fasting enough, serving the poor and the homeless enough. Until a moment when he went to a Bible study on a road in London called Aldersgate Street. And he wrote in his journal that, well... The, the introduction to the book of Romans was being read. And the guy was talking about the change in the hearts that God makes. That he believed he no longer had to be good enough. My kids don't have to be good enough for me to love them. I already love them. He says his heart was strangely warmed. And he believed that God could honestly forgive him of his sins. And he didn't need to earn that. I love you. And God loves you more than I ever could. And you don't need to earn it. That's the God we're here to worship today. We have a couple of announcements for us. Actually, a few extras, so kind of stick with me, if you will. Um, first of all, you, you may have noticed that, uh, that the ladies' bathroom down the hall here is out of order. The most important thing is to know in all schools, churches, and government facilities where the bathroom is, right? Uh, so there is a bathroom right across from my hallway. Uh, where my office is. There's a bathroom. You can go in the fellowship hall immediately to your right through the, through the door there. Um, and then there is a bathroom upstairs as well. So just want you to know that all of those are available to you. Uh, and let's see. Also, want to let you all know, um, we've been running into a great problem in, in our services. Okay, We have uh, been having actually a, a little bit of overflow of parking. Uh, if you didn't know this, we have two parking lots. We have the concrete one right out here, but we also have a grass lot that's next to the parsonage, uh, which is just around the corner here. The parsonage is my house. It's the brick house that looks a little bit like the church. Um, and what I want to do is I want to encourage people, because our concrete parking lot is a little smaller, uh, for those of you who, who perhaps uh, have the physical ability and you've perhaps been coming here for a while, consider parking in the grass parking lot. The back door of the church will be open. And what that does is it'll just create more space for visitors as they come so that they can feel more welcomed and loved. But if you need that, that closeness of the concrete, please feel free to continue using it. Uh, we're just trying to utilize the space the best we can. <laughs> Lastly, I want to share with you uh, just a reminder about our um, Sleep in Heavenly Peace project. I am so jazzed about this. This is a project where we are... We've been raising funds to build bunk beds for people in our com community, kids in our community, who are currently sleeping on the floor or do not have their own beds. 
The original goal of our women's group was to build 10 bunk beds. We blew that out of the water when we started getting up to 15 bunk beds when we set the second goal. We are now up to, I understand, 19 bunk beds? 19 bunk beds have been paid for, okay? Now the ladies are saying, let's see if we can push it and get to 20, all right? So on that same note, on November 5th, next month, we are going to be having a build day here at the church. And even if you, you, you don't, uh, we have things for people of all abilities. There's even rules for people to just sit and sort out screws and bolts. All right, whether you can lift heavy things or not, I encourage you to come on November 5th, help us out. It's going to be a great opportunity to really be the hands and feet of Christ and to change some lives in our community. Please. The more bunk beds we, we build, the more volunteers we need. Mm -hmm. If you have not already signed up, please contact me. I'll put you on the list. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, the more bunk beds we have, the more hands we're going to need to build them. If you'd like to volunteer, please see Miss Alona right here, um, and she will make sure that you get on the list. Great. Anything else for the good of the family? Y'all pray with me? Heavenly Father God, we come into your home today because we love to spend time with you. Because the only way to, to grow closer to someone you're in relationship with it is to sit with them, to, to talk with them. And Lord, as our Savior, as, as the one who came and died for us and rose again, as the creator of the universe, Lord, you want to get to know us. And even more so, Lord, you let us get to know you. And so it is in the excitement and joy of that space that we come before your throne right now. We sit open-hearted, ready to receive whatever it is you have for us. As we pray this all in Christ's holy name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Let us all join in our hymn of praise, number 580, Lead On, O King Church. And please stand if you're able. <laughs> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, 
by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in... Wait a minute. See, I told you I was going to get the wrong thing. I told him right before service I was going to do something wrong. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And a nice, he starts his letters the same way. In keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as, on, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I continually remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God uh, gives us, gives us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and calls us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Y'all, this is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have this beautiful tradition, and I find it even more beautiful today as we've been exploring not just Methodism, but the history of the church. That we join the voices of countless others throughout time and history, throughout backgrounds, for all those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we take a moment right now to confess what we believe about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to join me and hear the words that you say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing the glory of God.
In a heart of meditation and worship, I invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing the doxology.
I want to invite the young people, anybody that is under 12 who would like to join me to come on down front. I want to invite you to make them feel welcome and join me in singing Jesus Loves Me. <laughs> Have a seat right here, y'all. Huh? Look at the thing. Turn around and look oh yeah, the. Me. I love it. I understand, CJ. You love helping make those, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Like Did you that. choose that picture? Uh huh. <laughs> That's really and cool. And the cat one. And the cat one. Nice. I love it. Oh, okay, here we go. Ah. That's awesome. Thank you, babe. Thank you, Lara. Okay, so Miss Ruby. You've got the box, right? All right. And you're going to make us guess what's inside. I don't know what's in there. Do you have a clue for us to make us guess? Yeah. What's the clue? It has wheels. It has wheels. A toy car. Her, her, her pink Volkswagen Beetle. Toy car, more specifically, a pink Volkswagen Beetle. Is that it? No. No? <laughs> That's a good guess, though. What, what, what did you say, Bea? A car. A car. Is it a car? Let's go ahead and see it. This is a pink Volkswagen Beetle. It is. It is. She I love it. That's okay. Yeah. So it is a car, and the name of this car is a Volkswagen oh, wait, Beetle. I just recognize it has eyes. It does have eyes. Wait. Here, why don't you take it real quick, stand up, and show everybody your car, okay? Hold it way up high. Way up high. There you go. Check it out. Cool. Can I see it? Now watch this, y'all. How many of you own a Volkswagen Beetle? <laughs> These were considered one of the coolest cars back in the day. She has a red one. She, she got a red one, too. I love it. And, and you know what's really neat about this? These are little, they call them bugs because they look like a little ladybug, right? <laughs> That's what the car looks like, is a little ladybug, so they called it a Volkswagen oh, Boog. Uh-huh. And, and I'll show you what it can do. Okay, hold, hold, okay, real quick, show me what it can do. Oh, nice, when you wind it up, it goes. That's super cool. Now, now, let me tell you something about this car, okay? When this car came out, it was not the only one that came out that year. Isn't that surprising? No, not yet. Believe it or not, there was lots of other cars, just like today. There's lots of other cars out there, right? Mm -hmm. There are big cars, small cars, there are trucks, there are vans, there's all kinds of stuff. There were wagons, everything else during that time. But this was one that a lot of people liked to drive. Now, the reason I share this with you is because there are probably just as many different kinds of cars as there is churches out there, right? Um. You guys ever notice there's lots of churches yeah, out yeah. there? Not as many cars. Not as many cars? Okay. No, no, not as many churches as there is cars. Not as many churches as there is cars. Okay. Yeah, probably. Different kinds of churches have different kinds of cars. Uh-huh. And oh. the city I grew up in in Michigan actually had some of the most amount of churches per people in the entire country. Oh. There was a church just about in every corner. But, you know, there's something we need to understand here. Okay, right now, there are millions of people all over the country, all over the world, doing exactly what we're doing. What? Right now, there are people all over the world in different languages and backgrounds and different, um, different countries that are worshiping Jesus this Sunday morning. Huh? And, and they're not all United Methodist. Some are from different backgrounds, like the Lutheran Church, or the Baptist Church, or the Church of God, or the Presbyterians, or, or, or Catholic, or, or all kinds of different stuff. But you know what we got in common? Who do we worship? God. God. And what's, who is the Son of God that died for our sins? Jesus. Jesus. We all worship Jesus. You see, we have different ways of doing things. 
Some of us like more traditional hymns. Some of us like more modern music. Some of us like to be very methodical in how we worship, like us. And, and others like to worship in different ways. So we recognize that we're all part of the same family. This is just the part of the family we belong to. And let me tell you this. Jesus tells us that we are all family. You and you and you and you and you are all adopted into the family of God when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. So I want you all to do me a favor. Right, at, right before we close, okay, stand up for just a minute, please. I want you to turn around and look out there at everybody. Those people are the grandpas and grandmas, the aunts and uncles that God gave you. You are allowed to think of them as your grandpas and grandmas, your aunts and uncles, because of Jesus Christ. Because this is the unique place, the unique church, just like a unique bug car that God gave just for you so you can know how loved you are. All right, now let's turn back around. And I'm going to ask you guys to pray with me, okay? Let's close our eyes and fold our hands. And I invite you to pray after me. Dear God, there are lots of churches in the world. But you have blessed me with this one. Thank you for my church family. And for Jesus Christ. Who died for us all. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Now here is your car. And. Would you like the box? No. It's CJ. Oh, hold on. Well, time out. We wanted to give everybody a chance first. So, CJ, I don't think you've had it in a little while. You can have the box, okay? Oh, I don't want it. I don't want it ever again. That's fine. You don't have to have it. All right, y'all go ahead. Go with Miss Rachel on upstairs. I've joked with our worship team before some Sunday. I need to just skip the sermon and sit there with them the whole time. I think it'd be fun. Some of y'all are all like, that might not be a bad idea. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, if y'all got your Bibles, grab them with me. We are going to head over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 5 to 10. Luke 17. Verses 5 to 10. And I think I've got the right scripture this time. Listen to this from the word of God. The apostles, that is the twelve that Jesus called, said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the small berry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. When he, will he say to the servant when he comes in from the fields, come along now and sit down to eat? No. Wouldn't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant? Because he did what he was told to do? No. So you also, when you have done everything you are told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. The word of God for you, the people of God. Thank you, God. So as I shared earlier, we are continuing on in this journey. But, but what makes last week, this week, and next week a little bit more unique is we've taken a turn in church history specifically to explore our history as United Methodists, more specifically as Methodists. Okay? Last week you heard me share a little bit about this guy named John Wesley, the guy God used to start the Methodist church. But as we said, we don't got the corner in the market of Jesus. Next week when you all come, we're actually going to take some time and we're going to explain a little bit more about what other brothers and sisters in Christ believe. What is it that the Lutherans believe? Or the Presbyterians? Or the Baptists? What is it that we believe in? And how is it that, that we've come to this place of saying we're still family, but we all have different ways of worshiping the same God? 
Okay? But today what we're going to do is we're going to move beyond John Wesley a little bit more deeply, and we're going to explore how it is the Methodist Church began. If you were here last week, you heard me share that John Wesley grew up going to church. His daddy was a pastor in the Church of England. John Wesley, before he was saved, graduated from Oxford University and became a pastor in the Church of England. John Wesley came to the United States before he was saved, and he served in what we now call Savannah, Georgia, where he tried really hard to get them to be as devout and pious as possible. The word pious simply means the ways we try to worship God and are disciplined to do that. When we read scripture, that's an act of piety. When we pray, when we fast, what we're doing right here, when we sing worship unto God, these are all acts of piety. Okay? And if you remember, John had this group that, that he helped to formulate at Oxford University, a college group, um, that, that they tried to be so disciplined in their acts of piety that they created a schedule. And, and on Mondays you do this, on Tuesdays you do that. Once a week they go serve the poor, once a week they go into the prisons, once a week they have to fast. And then he came to the stage and tried to get his church to do that. How long would I last as your pastor? If I said, you can be a part of the church if you fast every Friday. If you go to the prisons or go serve the poor every Thursday. If you read the Old Testament, the original Hebrew, the New Testament, and the Greek on Monday or Wednesday or whatever. Yeah, he kind of bombed. Okay. Goes back to England in disgrace. Realizes that there's other people that have this amazing trust and this faith in God. And even in the face of death itself that he doesn't have. And he struggled with depression for a number of years because of this. He struggled with self-identity. I'm a pastor, he says. I I've done everything I could to trust in God, and yet clearly he saw some kids on a ship during a horrible storm where they thought they were all going to die who seemed to have more faith than him. Who are sitting there saying, if we live, we praise the Lord. If we die, we praise the Lord. Either way, we're going to praise the Lord. And John couldn't wrap his brain around that. How could children have a stronger faith in God than him with his disciplined as he was. After dealing really with so hard, deep depression for a number of years, after being mentored by a couple of different people, by the way, many of which weren't even pastors, they were just people from a church. One day he was invited to a Bible study in London on a road called Aldersgate. And as I told you in the beginning, he goes in there, and this is what he writes in his journal, okay? He says, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a, a, a society that is a small group at Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle of the Romans. That is what Martin Luther wrote at the beginning to introduce the Book of Romans in his, in his uh, um, commentary. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. He no longer tried to earn it. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Well, you need to understand that everything changed for John. From that moment on, he didn't do all those things to try and earn God's love, to be good enough. But he also didn't stop in as disciplined of a life as he left, lived. As in, some people picked on him in Oxford, methodical <coughs> as a life as he lived. Which is where we get the word Methodist from. We are a people of method. We do this in consistency so we will keep ourselves disciplined in the Word of God. He changed it, and he did it not because he felt an obligation to, but all of a sudden he wanted to. I mean, why is it every evening that my wife and I take the time to make sure that we bathe our kids? You know, that we tell a baby, go take a shower, and we take a layer, and we're, te we're teaching her right now how to bathe herself so we don't have to all the time. But why do we do that? Why do we get into this method? 
of doing it over and over again. Why is it that every night before we go to bed, my wife and I take time and we do devotionals together? Why do I kiss her? Why do I tell my children I love you? The same times before they leave the house and before we go to bed. Why do I have these methods? Of course they know I love them, right? I want to tell them. I want to do it again. I want to pray the Lord's Prayer like we do every Sunday. I want to sing the doxology every Sunday. I want to sing Jesus loves me for our children. So they're surrounded by worship in the presence of God as they come before the altar of the Lord. And we laugh and have fun together every Sunday. This is part of who we are, y'all. And it's for this reason that, that things changed for John. You see, in the early Methodist, or in the early church in England during this time, it was only the extremely wealthy that went to church. Okay? First of all, either they, some could not afford to go, that they actually had it where you had to pay to sit in the front pews of the church. Okay? If we did that today, it wouldn't work out. I'd have to charge you to sit in the back rows, because nobody's going to pay to sit in the front rows anymore. <laughs> but then, those who were poor couldn't afford the elaborate, beautiful clothes to go to church. So even if they went, they felt ashamed. You need to understand there was something else happening in England during this time. Between roughly 700 AD and 1800 AD, the population of England doubled. All right? This is also during the time of the, um, of, uh, uh, the, um, man, I can't think of the word. I'm sorry. The Industrial Revolution. There we go. And, and where jobs used to be plentiful, all of a sudden machines started taking people's jobs. And with so many people, there was less and less jobs to be taken. And so they were paying them less and less and less. And so by the time John Wesley comes on the scene as an adult in the mid to late 1700s, poverty is running rampant all over the place. On education, it is crazy all over the place. There's this huge gap between the wealthy and the poor. It's so bad that there are accounts of women sitting in the curbs on the street getting their little children drunk. Because no one has ever taught them not to do it. And they think the only, the only nourishment they can get for their kids is booze. There are people literally stepping over hungry, hurting, dying people to get into church on Sunday morning. And it breaks John's heart. Remember, John came back from, from America, so he wasn't appointed to a church at this time. He would go around, go around from church to church as a guest preacher. And he would preach about Jesus Christ and how he, he loved on the broken and the hurting and the lost. Uh, about how he would go after the disease and the people who were just, um, just thrown aside by society. And I kid you not, church after church he was kicked out of and told never come back here again. It was in uh, April of 1739. He did something radical that at that time had never been done before except for in one place in Germany. But he didn't know it at the time. He did something called field preaching. He went out of the church. And he recognized that there were so many people who were, who were being slave driven basically. In, in, in sweatshops and child labor. And, and women, were being, um, w women were being exploited financially. And, and in every other way that you could. And people were being forced to work 12 14, 16 hour days with no time off at all. Not even a day off. And so John said, if they can't come to me, I'm going to come to them. And he would actually go out into the fields as people were working. And he would preach to them while they're working. He would go into sweatshops. And if the managers would let him, he would stand there and yell over top of the machines and the workers the truth and love of Jesus Christ. I told you last week about how he would go out and stand at the coal mines. These people who, who would go underground before the sun went up and come out after the sun went down. And so their eyes had so badly adjusted to the fact that they never saw the sun. It wasn't safe for them to be awake and outdoors when the sun was up. And he would stand there and he would purposely schedule times of teaching those people how to read and write. And as we said, the only textbook he'd use is the word of God. And he scheduled that to when the moon was the brightest. He tracked the face of the moon just so he could do that. 
John, John Wesley, as, as I shared before, I told you about when the Holy Club, that, that college group, had started to, um, had started to do like a, um, care for the poor, uh, start a, a school for children that were in need, that they created loans for, for small business people who could not afford to even buy the basic tools. John Wesley continued on in this ministry. I mean, so many hospitals and poorhouses so, so many schools that, that he began to formulate and, and, and form during this time. With as educated as he was, in the truth and love of Jesus Christ, the first book he ever published was a book of home remedies. And it was for people who couldn't afford to go to a doctor. I always thought that was so cool. Even up until the age of 80, after he started a worldwide movement for the kingdom of God, he was known up until the last year of his life to be walking in the snow, door to door, getting alms for the poor. But he was a tenacious guy. Okay, he did not mince words. Uh, he was a little extra blunt, if you will. And uh, <laughs> when, when, when somebody would come up to him in one of the poor houses or, or in another way, and, and um, they say, oh, my rent is due tomorrow, and they're going to kick me out if I don't do something, but they knew all month that their rent was going to be due that day. He'd say, uh, your lack of preparation does not instigate my emergency. Goodbye. He would not let himself be taken advantage of. At the same time, though, one of his other famous phrases was, if you have three coins and your lunch costs one or two, you should have already given away the other one to care for the poor. That's just kind of the guy he was. Based off of this, John was very heavily influenced by another group of Christians called the Moravians. And he loved how they organized their worshipers together. They didn't do church in the traditional sense we do. What they would do is they would gather together people in homes, usually about 12, give or take. It's like Jesus knew what he was doing, you know? I've always found that too. Any more than 12, and, and you don't have as close of an intimate group together. Um, he gathered them together. And, and, and these groups, and they call them class meetings. And there was only one requirement to go to a class meeting. And that is a sincere desire to flee from the wrath to come and to be saved from your sins. You didn't even have to say that that was Jesus that saved you yet. If you are willing to have a sincere desire to flee from the wrath to come and be saved of your sins, you could go to the class meetings. At these class meetings, they would read scripture sometimes, sometimes they would sing, sometimes they'd pray. But the idea was that it was safe space to talk with each other, to be loved on and take care of each other, and to be kept accountable in the love of God. <laughs> every time they sit down and they would ask, the leader would ask everybody, they would go around the room with the exact same question, again, methodical, and they'd ask, how is it with your soul? And the idea was that you could share questions, concerns, ideas, things you were wrestling with, anything, in a safe space. And that that group of people was assigned to take care of you and you them in your community. Well, for people who wanted to go even deeper into their faith, there was something else that was started called bands. Okay? And, and bands are something you needed to be invited to be a part of. And the only reason why is because in the, the bands... They, there would be four different types of groups. There would be unmarried women, unmarried men, married women, married men. You have four different types of groups. And, and in these bands, they would be spiritually accountable to each other. They would say, you know, I've, I've really been wrestling with this sin. Or, you know, I've, I've really had this doubt in me. Or, or y'all, I, I need your prayers because i I got something big coming up. It was a very vulnerable place. And the reason you needed to be invited into it was because they needed to know you were serious about your faith in Jesus Christ and you weren't a gossiper. That was the primary thing. As a matter of fact, anybody could become a Methodist by, by, by answering that question, a sincere desire to flee from the wrath to come um, and to be saved from, from your sins. But to remain a Methodist, there were three requirements. This is how you got into that, that, the bands, that, that closer-knit group. You had the covenant to say, I'm going to avoid evil. Not that you're not going to do evil, nobody's perfect, but it would actually specifically mention the things. They, 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 would, they would list out a number of evil things that people wrestle with 
certain thoughts, actions, words, desires, and say, I'm going to at least attempt to flee from those things, avoid evil, number one. And I'm willing to be kept accountable to it. Number two, I am going to do good of all kinds. In other words, I am going to go serve somebody. I'm not just going to warm a pew on Sunday morning and say, I'm a good Christian because I went to church. I'm going to put my faith in action. And I'm willing to be kept accountable to that. I'm going to go serve the poor. I'm going to go to the prisons. I'm going to check on my neighbor who, who, who can't get out, whatever it is. I'm going to serve others, do good of all kind. Avoid evil, do good of all kind. And number three, attend to the ordinances of God. Basically what that means is that word I used earlier, piety. Okay? I am going to be about my relationship with God. Look, as I said before, yeah, I can sit here and, tell my, and not tell my kids I love them and assume they do. But I want to tell them. I can sit there and not kiss my wife goodnight. I can sit there and, and avoid her all day long. I want to invest in my relationship with my wife. Why do we connect with God? Why do we keep coming back week after week? Why are we so methodical in how we worship? Because the only way to build a relationship is to invest in it. And so in order to remain a part of, of these bands, you, you would covenant to say, I want you to keep me accountable, and I'm willing to keep you accountable in love, not in persecution, avoiding evil, doing good of all kinds, and attending to the ordinances of God regularly. It's interesting because these groups began to grow like crazy. And, and they began to have to gather them together in what they called societies. Now, the class meetings of the bands, they would get together in a whole jurisdictional area. They called these societies. Okay? Like once every three months, once a quarter. And at these society gatherings, it would just be this huge time of connecting and coming together. People would bring as much food as they could so that everyone could eat even if you didn't have any food. It'd be a time of sharing testimonies and sharing what God has done with your small group, encouraging one another, praying for one another. Okay? It would be a good old potluck. We're Methodists. When we meet, we eat. Right? I love it. One of the more common practices was they had a two-handled cup. And I forgot the first service, too. I forgot this one. I got one in my office. Two-handled cup filled with water. And the idea was that you would pass around your small group, either your band or your, your class meeting, and everyone would get a chance to take a drink. And, and the idea was that you would never let go of the handle until the other person has their hand on the cup. We're always passing on the love, the grace, the filling, the refreshing of God in our little family here in our circle. And they called that a love feast. Okay? This began to grow so big that it actually began to reach out and it went beyond England into Ireland and into Scotland. Eventually, people began to immigrate to the new United States, all right, specifically in Maryland and New York. Some of these people that had established these societies, the ones that encompassed the, the, the class meetings of the bands, they came to the United States and they started to establish them here. It's interesting because during this time, John Wesley, in the 1940s, not only began to use lay servants, a lay person is everyone that's not the pastor. So if you aren't the pastor here, you're a lay person. Okay? He would use lay people as ministers because these groups were growing so wildly quick, so big. In the, in the 1740s, he began to use women as clergy. How radical and how cool is that? All right? Um... By 1770s, he began to get all these people together. He noticed that, that they were growing so quick they needed to begin um, doing something called circuit riding, where, where anybody that was a pastor and was ordained, they would be assigned to a group of groups, all right? A group of class meetings, a group of bands, a group of societies, because their job was to go around and do the pastor thing that they were called to, to bless weddings and to bless the sacraments of communion and, and to marry people, uh, um, baptize, uh, do all these kinds of things. And so there was a circuit rider that would go around. This church, in the early days, was actually on a circuit. Y'all shared a pastor with other churches. We have it in our <laughs> church history records. Okay? 
And, and, and so this began happening here in the States as well. And John Wesley would gather all the pastors as he could, and he would, he would teach them. He would make sure that they're preaching what's in the Bible, biblical, correct things, and help them out. He would help them understand what our theology is. Let me tell you what he would teach them. He'd say, okay, this is the crux of, of, of Methodism as a whole. He'd say, we focus on three things. First of all, provenient grace. Provenient grace, now, every denomination has their own version of this. This is just ours. Provenient grace is pre-grace. Though he said, God loved you even before you knew it. Those times when you look back in your life and go, oh, man, I, I can so clearly see how he loved me and helped me through that. Or those moments in your life when you go, wow, I, I, it never struck me until now how much God was guiding me. Or even, no, I should have died there. God loved you before you even knew him. That proves his love towards us. We preach about justifying grace. That's the moment of salvation. And too many churches stop there. But one thing that I love about Methodism is we go one step farther and we teach about stuff called sanctifying grace. That's your, your path as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We, we don't just stop at the moment of salvation. We spend the rest of our lives seeking to be sanctified. To, to seek to be sacred in God's eyes. To develop our lives. To go deeper in our faith. To, to be about that servanthood and loving on other people. It's, it's interesting because over the years, y'all, you need to understand that Methodists have come together and broken up many, many, many different times. United Methodism is not the only Methodist church by far. As a matter of fact, it was two denominations that came together to create the Evangelical United Brethren Church many, many years ago. Most of them were from Germany. Another group that came together in the 1930s, four different churches that came together to create the Methodist Church. And in 1986, the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodist Church came together to create the United Methodist Church. But you need to understand that, that Methodists have come together and split apart many, many times over everything from, from people who didn't believe slavery should end to, to the fact of, of women being in ministry to, to how much should African Americans be involved or not in the church to should we have bishops over us or not. As a matter of fact, as I looked into it, you need to understand that, that there are even Methodist churches today that you'd recognize the name of, but you may not know we're Methodist. The African Methodist Episcopal Church. We have a bunch of those here around town. We all came from the same family. Okay, The Free Methodist Church. The African Methodist Episcopal Church Zion. The Salvation Army. These are all groups that have said, we want to be a part of the Methodists, and then we, we've come up for this reason or that reason. As a matter of fact, I did a, a quick study to check it out. There are over 70 different Methodist denominations around the world today in Asia, the Caribbean, Africa, Europe, America, and the Middle East. 70 different denominations that all say we come from those roots. We come from a Christmas conference that John Wesley held a long time ago um, in, uh, I had it written down, 1738, or no, 1743, I'm sorry, um, where he called all of these pastors from all over together, and he said, I don't want to create a new denomination. But there were so many churches, so many of these class meetings and groups popping up all over that he could not keep track of it all. And so through a lot of conversation and because of the, um, because of America trying to break away from England, there was a lot of problems getting pastors of the Church of England to come over here. And eventually we became the Methodist Episcopal Church under John Wesley. Now, all of that to be said, the one thing I've noticed, I, I noticed that, that when we stop being an itinerant, or a... Uh, um, a circuit riding church. In other words, the lay people of the church were the leaders, the pastors, just help preach. And the pastors started staying put. When we started 
to, to say, you no longer have to be held accountable. We'll, we'll, we'll ask you vows when you become a member, but don't worry, no one will ever ask you anything beyond that. When, when, when we started to make sure that anybody could become a member of the church, and then you could stop attending, and that was okay, the church as a whole started to decline dramatically. It's interesting because historically speaking, when the church was, was thriving at its greatest, was the time when we were willing to be in relationship with each other, be held accountable, and to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. The disciples said, Jesus, increase our faith. We, we want to believe more. He says, you don't need a big, fancy faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to a mulberry tree, move, and it will. <coughs> he says, if, if a servant does their job, does the master sit there and praise him over and over? No. Do, 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 do you want your kids to go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, for, for feeding them when they're children? No. It's just what you do. You just, you serve the Lord. That's what it means. Be willing to serve him. Be willing to say he is the king. And I am just a humble, lowly servant. And inside of that space, he will do awesome things. So, my challenge, my question for us is as our history says, we are people who love to care for the abused and the neglected. We are people who are methodical in our piety. doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It just means I'm putting effort in. We are people who says salvation is great, but there's more to it. There's discipleship. Where are you being challenged to go deeper with your God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to serve you. We thank you, Heavenly Father God, for, for teaching us what it means to be your disciples. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we dive deeper into who we are, that, that we can have our hearts set on fire for your kingdom. Help us, God, to not just be worried about what we can get, but more so, Lord, how we can serve you. And in that, we'll find the very love that we've been longing for. We pray this all in Christ's name. As is our tradition on the first Sunday of the month, we're going to take some time right now to receive that element of piety through what we call the Holy Sacrament of Communion. We're going to join the voices of countless others throughout history, and I invite you to prepare yourself. Don't just recite the words. Hear what you say today. I'll read the parts in white if you'll read the parts in yellow. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. There's that prevenient grace that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, for all of your sins, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us offer one another signs of reconciliation and love. I invite you just to stand up for a minute and let each other know you are loved because of Christ.
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, which by the way is here among us, we praise your name, God, and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death, made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. <coughs> On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, Father, and he broke that bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, Father, he gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in your Son, Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the most beautiful mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Lord, if I may be bold enough, I humbly ask you for your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we together feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, <coughs> the Father, now and forever. Amen. I want to invite those who are going to be assisting to come and make their way forward. And I want to share something with you as I do so. Um, before the pandemic, we had this beautiful tradition of having the ushers di dismiss y'all by a few rows at a time, coming up. For those who wish to kneel, you are welcome to kneel. For those who wish to stand, you are welcome to stand. And then we will come by and give you the elements. I will give a blessing, and then together we partake as family. That group then stands, goes on the outside, and goes and has a seat when the next group comes up. Um, our worship committee believes that it is time to come back to that space so that we can partake as family in small groups once again. So I invite you to come as the ushers dismiss you.
my friends, no matter what you've been through, what you've done, or what's been done to you, I love you. And God loves you more than I ever could. So receive that as your blessing. Arise and go in peace. Why do we tell our loved ones that we care when they've heard it before? Because we want to. God tells you over and over and over again how much he loves you. Go reciprocate that and share how much you love him back. Receive that as your mission. Arise and go in peace.
according to the world, how God worked in us to bring about how we worship should not have worked. We are the ragtag group of throwaways, unwealthy, uneducated people. At least that's where we come from. I know many of you are highly educated. Um, but it is the people who are hungry to love and to be loved. That's who the Methodist Church began with. Those are the people that we are called to reach out to. And if that is you, which I believe all of us in some form or another fit into that place, that is the reason that you need to know how loved you are by your God. So go from this place knowing we do these things because he first loved us and because we get to keep knowing him more and more as we grow in our faith. Receive that as your mission and your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.